Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Welcome back to another episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have Bruce Kennedy on the show with me today. He's got a pretty interesting perspective into North Valley and Golden State Baptist College. And so I'm excited to welcome him on the show. And uh, yeah, if Bruce, if you could just introduce yourself, let my audience know just a little bit about how you got introduced to the IFB movement. Absolutely. Uh, hi, Eric. My name is Bruce. Thanks for having me. So I was born and raised in IFB at North Valley. My parents are from Midwest, Michigan and Ohio, and they both worked for one company, Nortel Networks, which was a very big telecom company back in the day. And so that company moved them a couple times to different states, ending in Santa Clara, California, where they moved in 89. And so they moved into the neighborhood that is, that North Valley is in. So people, began knocking on their doors. Eventually it was actually the, the Harrells. They're, they're, they were fairly, I don't popular is the wrong word, but they were a big family in North Valley and they lived right down a couple houses down. So they knocked on my door, got my parents to come. They started going to church. I was born in 93. I think they had already been going for at least two years at that time. And so I was, you know, raised in the movement but since my parents had came to it a little bit later in life having been my dad was lutheran when he was young and my mom was basically charismatic i don't remember what the exact denomination was but they were not adamant about it especially as adults they had moved away from their families and found their own ways as adults and then came back to christianity once moving into the north valley realm being raised in it myself, I took a much more literal and serious approach to the standards and the doctrines and things and the ideas that were taught. And I would tell my parents, oh, we shouldn't be watching this movie. We shouldn't be doing this and that type of stuff. And n- not that it was only one way, but it was I was definitely very ingrained in the mentality you're not going to teach sunday school teacher here in this church and believe that wine and liquor and the movie house and filthiness is a way of life that's not on my watch you say well they'll leave i know they might they have they will i went to north valley baptist school starting in kindergarten all the way through 12th grade north valley baptist schools pursuing excellence in christian education for more than 40 years our school exists to offer an exceptional and balanced education for our students in preparation for a life of service to Jesus Christ. I guess that's most of the backstory. We can go into some of the specifics about sure. North Valley unless there's, you wanted to yeah. change topics. Yeah, I mean, I know you spent your early, essentially your entire life there. You, two, two is before you're really making any kind of core memories or anything. Would you say that your initial feelings toward the church and the movement was positive because that's one thing I just like to lay out right out of the gate because I think one of the first rebuttals when people hear these stories is, well, they never liked it. Now they're getting out and just trying to bash it. But would you say that you were, did you like being there? Did you love being there? Like how, how into it were you throughout your childhood years? I was very into uh, many of the ideas and the concepts uh, a lot of the salvation ideas were very, I took very literally. I got saved when I was four, and it was actually uh, Cindy Treber hmm. that, that uh, wow. led me to the Lord. Yeah, and it was, you know, just, a, I remember being a church service where they were just telling people to come forward and get saved, so I did. And hmm. I, maybe there was some conviction, I think, but it was, I didn't really comprehend what I was 
doing with my spirituality by making that kind of a commitment. It was just, this is what we do in this church. So here you go do it. And we got baptized and my parents got rebaptized at the same time, which is an interesting concept on its own. There were things that I couldn't really get all the way on board with as, as I got older, even in early middle school, when I was still into a lot of the doctrine, like soul winning was always a, a problem for me. Going out, going soul winning, knocking on doors. I could never bring myself to really commit to try to like win somebody. Like right. just the mental battle never jived well with me. And I would go out, I would hang out with people while we were soul winning. I would knock on the door, but I would do my best to just leave a track or say hi. Right. And what was the barrier there? Was it just like the idea of trying to convince someone to believe something else? Was it just the fear of what they would think about you or what was a big roadblock? There? You have to, you, in order to legitimately change somebody's perspective on something, you have to really have internalized that for yourself. Hmm. And while I had internalized the concepts, I hadn't internalized the knowledge in the, Right. These are, we're just playing with words at this point, but yeah. I, I think at some level I knew that I was playing a game mm. and I wasn't, I was playing a game that had these different categories to make it look like you were playing the same game as everybody else. I was into playing the game, but I was not into the conviction, I think. And it's such a, a broad concept, the, the yeah. idea of, your spirituality and then affecting somebody else's spirituality at the same time. So, and especially in hindsight, it's real, it's really hard to look back and have a, a real solid idea of what I was and wasn't committed to. But I think at the end of the day, I was very about North Valley. I was into North Valley. Like I worshiped Jack Treber. i would do anything and everything he said and, and took notes. And right. there were still certain things that I think I was considered. I, w I wasn't like um, a preacher boy in that sense. I, I didn't like, I wasn't like one of the, the perfect ones or those, these are all like really weird concepts, but I was like in the middle, but I was definitely into it. Yeah. So you'd say like your religion, I guess at that time was like North Valley more than it was like, it, and, and what was the magnet there? I, I, I understand, obviously, it's a very charismatic kind of culture. And from at least from the outside looking in, that the leadership seems very charismatic. And there is this kind of, I always say this, like the reason that Jack Hiles and Treber and fill in the blank with all of these huge names in fundamentalism, the reason they have big churches is because they themselves have a draw to them. There is a character there where it does it's magnetic for people would you say that was what drew you in the most was like just the atmosphere was so energetic or was it like there was there some concept they were sharing that you were like oh i like the idea of that being true so i'll just chase after that like what was the magnet for you you know i don't know if magnet is the right analogy i don't think it was like i had something else and then it was i was being drawn that way it's more like this was the direction I was shown and I was just about doing what was right. And there's in no other option of what was right. Yeah. Right. And I think, okay, so the draw for me was doing what was right. And I was, I had all this direction and instruction that this is what's right. And this is how you do the, these are the actions that are right. And I can't speak for other people's spiritual connection when either they're young or they're coming up in a church or they find Christianity in a church. I never, I would pray and I would say the words and I would do all the stuff, but I never felt a, like a real connection with God as a Christian. Cause it was more about doing the things, not the feelings. It wasn't about, I don't want to say it wasn't about how you felt because they definitely took a lot of consideration for the way different people were feeling about things, but it was always, categorized around how it's going to get you closer to God or how you can deal with that feeling to, to push you closer to God and not actually accepting the feeling for your own and actually dealing with it 
at a, at a human level. Without the knowledge of why I am the way I am, and all of a sudden now I'm not going to go door to door soul winning. It's not that important. I'm not going to preach my high standards. It's not that important. I'm not going to hold the line on that music uh, of my of my founding fathers uh, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, and I'm not going to I'm not going to toe the line of that old time religion, and and I'm going to look at these things, and I'm going to change them. Why? Because I'm defining myself according to this rather than this. And instead of having the knowledge of God's word, I'm having the knowledge of outside influences through brotherly kindness. And I am taking that and I have all good intentions, but my good intentions are causing me to hurt my followers. Obviously, again, you're incorporated in this. You're like, you've got the rose-colored glasses on in a lot of ways. There's a very... You're just a part of this culture. Like you, you were placed in it. You were going this direction. Like when's the first time that you noticed like a blemish on kind of the culture there or the first time that maybe the rose colored glasses fell off a little bit while you were attending uh, the church? I, I can't say there was one moment where I was like, oh, because of that one thing that like totally shifted. It was very cumulative. A lot of the human failures seeing people just not being the perfect Christian that they're advertised to be and that being swept under the rug or just not really acknowledged in any meaningful way or just the inconsistencies. I I was listening to a lot of your episodes and something that somebody said made me think of the special treatment that some of the close circle would receive. For example, Treber would give all of the staff kids these huge presents, like a a $200 remote control car. Every staff kid would get one. And, and I was friends with the staff kids, but I wasn't a staff kid. So I'd go over and play and be like, what's going on with this? Well, and then the next day he'd have a service preaching about how Santa Claus is evil. I'm like, you just played Santa Claus to all those kids though. And that's fine. But also where's the consistency? See, this is where I don't want to delve too much into the personal things because then people are going to be like, oh, he's just bitter or this thing or whatever. It's not about that. I'm just trying to give analogies. Yeah. The, to answer your question, it was much more of a gradual process. And once I got older, it was much more about the, the logic issues. Yeah. And I'd start asking questions about things that they were saying about what was in the Bible or different political ideas. And people would just be like, don't ask that question or just the year you're having wicked thoughts just for thinking that way, those types of things. So that was what really started pushing me away was when I started having questions that wouldn't be answered. Sure. We had talked earlier about how I had been in the sound ministry there and North Valley is very strict about dress standards. The church has authority to set dress standards. The church at Hollywood shouldn't set our standards. And I'm going to say it tonight just to clarify my position. I have no confidence in a preacher whose wife's walking around in leggings. Don't look down, sir. Look back, look up in here. This is where the preaching is. I have no confidence in a man walking around in sprayed on blue jeans. So tight you put a quarter in her back pocket, read if it's heads or tails. Amen. That's wicked. That's worldly, friend. I've never liked wearing a tie. I'm always uncomfortable when I wear a tie. And... I, for a while, I would, I would dress up, I would wear a suit and tie and stuff to work in the sound ministry. And then after I had been doing it for a number of years, I didn't start dressing like a bum, but I would just wear a nice pair of pants and a nice shirt and a jacket. And eventually I got asked to leave. I didn't know why. And, And then came to find out later it was because the way I was dressing. But there hadn't been any communication other than one comment like two years previous where Treber had said, like, you shouldn't be wearing that jacket or something like that. I don't know. That wasn't really a violation in any way, but it is a big part of what pushed me away. Yeah. It was just the being so hard nosed about things that weren't big deals. (laughs) And uh, yeah, I definitely feel like from everybody I talk to, it's like a pressure cooker. There's so much pressure in the culture there on dress and appearance and 
yeah, it's definitely, definitely interesting. I, I know one thing you mentioned was the, you said mentioned like people not acting the way that they said that they believed and a lot of things being swept under the rug. And one, one of the big reasons that I initially got in touch with you was over a pretty large case that got swept under the rug and done away with Mike Zachary. And I have this tendency everywhere I go of getting in lots of trouble. With this case specifically, and I told you this beforehand, like Mike Zachary has been whispered around in fundamentalist circles, both people on the outside and on the inside. And while it's pretty clear what happened, there's been no like concrete, like, hey, here's someone who actually knows what happened. It's all been these secondhand accounts. And can you just break down for me the kind of the Mike Zachary situation? Because uh, I can say from my perspective, I was on the West Coast. I saw him you know, show up at West Coast Baptist College and Lancaster Baptist Church. One of the greatest aspects of West Coast is who you'll learn from. On this campus, you'll be mentored by genuine, servant-hearted men and women of God who truly expend themselves for the cause of Christ. Our entire team of faculty and staff give themselves every week on the front lines of ministry. He was there for a few months and he was out in record time. And the allegations that were swirling around that were pretty bad. And then you start following the trail back to Hiles, to Golden State. So what happened with Mike Zachary? And like, how did your family get connected with his in the first place? Sure. So I guess I'll start with our introduction to him. So when my parents moved into that neighborhood, he was, I believe him and his family was already living there. I'm not sure exactly, you know, what the time frame was in my very early childhood, but by the time I was in first or second grade, kindergarten for second grade, I was very close friends with his youngest son. Uh-huh. They lived down, right down the street on the same street. I was hanging out with that kid every day. We'd call each other. I'd call him. He'd call me. Either I'd be at his house or he'd be at mine. And I don't remember much being too off at that point other than typical strange things about hardcore Christian families, stories about ridiculous spankings and crazy expectations from a parent and those types of things. So they, they lived in the neighborhood. They're going to the church. He was already, okay, no, actually I'm sorry. So he, I think they came when I was a little bit young, when I was in like kindergarten ish. Cause I I remember there, I think there had been a different pianist. Hmm. I'm not sure about this the exact timing of this, but I feel like I remember he came and replaced a different pianist when I was very young. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, he was the head pianist and I don't know if he was officially the music director, but he was in charge of much of the music program. Eventually he became a music instructor at GSBC. And he was this amazing piano player that like, the likes of which nobody had ever seen before. It was impressive. He was very impressive to just listen to him play piano. It would move a whole room of people. Mm-hmm. And that has an effect on his ego and on the people around him. So mm-hmm. there was this perception of he was just this enigma almost mm-hmm. of music and he knew legal practices and all these things. So he had all these different things that he was very active with in the church. Among other things, he taught piano lessons. And so the, the piano lessons were as far as I know where most of the, again, I want to be very careful with what I say here, but the abuse that took place that I'm aware of mostly took place within the the context of piano lessons, both for myself and for at least a couple of others. Okay. That being said, him, Mike and my father were close friends. My dad's a handyman. He's always fixing stuff for people. So he was always fixing stuff for Mike, whether it was a car, dishwasher, whatever. So outside of being church friends and neighbors, there was also very close. So when I started taking piano lessons from me, I, let me back up a little bit. So I took piano lessons for about seven and a half to eight years. 
and the first three and a half or so were with somebody who had actually been his piano student. Okay. And then she left, she got married, left the church, went somewhere else. And so then I started taking with him. And again, at this, at that point, I was already very much, our friends were very, our families are very close. I was in, if I had to guess, I was probably in somewhere between fourth and sixth grade, probably fourth or fifth grade when I started with taking lessons with him. And uh, you said fifth or sixth, f- fourth or fifth. Okay. I think when I started with him, I think I ended in around eighth grade with him. Okay. When I started the lessons, our families were already very close. So there was, there was already a relationship that I had with him as a friend, basically. Right. And so there was, it was already a very comfortable environment right. to be around him. You spent your, I mean, your whole childhood at his house, hanging out with his kids. Yeah. yeah I'd be careful saying my whole childhood, but again, I was very close with his youngest son for a number of years. So he, when I started with the lessons, he told my mom, there always needs to be a parent in the room. Right. And when I talked to her about this, she mentioned that it was strange the way that he had mentioned it. Yeah. Okay. And so for, you know, at least probably a year or so, maybe a little bit longer, my mom was always there. She would come, she'd sit in the room while the lesson was going on and then leave. And then at some point that she just stopped staying, either I would walk to the college where the lessons were, he would have his lessons either, Usually they were in the pra- piano practice rooms at the college. Okay. So uh, I lived in the neighborhood. I could walk to the college. So if, either if it was after school, I'd walk over there and, or she'd drop me off and not stick around, whatever. And that was when things started getting a little bit more direct. Right. I should b- back up a little bit again. So Mike is a very hands-on guy in general so when you're conversating with him if there's a group of two or three guys excuse me standing around talking he's gonna if he's saying something he might put his hand on your shoulder or he might pat you on the back just those types of things were very common in his conversational flow and so i was used to that already so then when i'd be by myself with him in the piano room and he'd sit down next to me on the bench and put his hand on my lower back or his hand on my thigh. It was not as off-putting as if I wasn't used to him already touching me. And I, I think that is what has what made it so at the time I didn't really realize what was happening. You know, and I'll be honest, it was not traumatic for me, but it still was grooming. Right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of things outside of that, that also happened. If you, did you have, I can, yeah, I was, if you had a question. Well, I was just going to say, just to be clear. So I know a lot of people who are familiar have heard like, yeah, it was during piano lessons with piano students. He was like, that's when he was doing this stuff. That, that was the rumors that were spreading. I know you had gone over with me beforehand, like how far it had progressed with you, which it never did progress to like, actual penetration or touching privates or anything like that. But what, when you say that he would be handsy or something during, during a piano lesson, like what did that mean in in your context and what had been normalized at that point? Before the lessons, what had been normalized? Like during the lessons, like once your mom stopped going, like when you say that he would be like, he would touch you in ways that you probably shouldn't have. What do you mean by that? Or what is a touch in that context? Sure. So I, I think it was pro- it was progressive. Having looked back on it, it, things started. I would say they in the lessons things mostly started with him touching more than necessary to show proper hand position. Mm-hmm. Like he would put his hand on top of yours to show the proper way to put your hand, and he would hold your arms to move them to the correct places. And these are always I, I don't like using absolute words. Is often or very you know, soft, almost harassing, but it wasn't obvious, right? It was very, it was, you know, seemed purposeful, 
but more than necessary. Yeah. And so that moved to eventually he would sit on the bench next to me. Some, not the whole time, not the whole lesson, just there would be a time where he's trying to show me something. He would sit next to me on the bench. And then after he showed me, he might put his hand on my lower back or right. while I'm playing something, he might put his hand on my thigh. It would be a lingering touch. It wouldn't just be like a reassurance or anything like that. Eventually he started, I, and this is actually something that he would do something a little bit like this in his regular conversation where he gets these little like pinchy fingers and he scrunches his face up and he, it's almost like a cute voice. I don't really want to say that's the wrong word, but I can't think of a better right. word. And he would just make a point and almost like as if it was, it's, it's, I don't know. It was weird, right. but it was just something he did. Eventually that turned into actual pinching where in a lesson he would be like, Oh, you, I can't remember what he actually said when he would do this or w right. what the actual context of the things. I just remember he would go get his hands like this and he'd like almost come at you and just pinch you on the shoulder or pinch you on the leg. And again, I'm just saying what happened. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know what the, if there was an end motive for that specific thing, if that was just part of his, I don't know. But the, the fact is it was definitely progressively more inappropriate touching. But it always towed that line where you could justify it as, oh, he's just being friendly or he's just showing me a new move or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That was most of what happened in the context of the lessons for me, for myself. Okay. I know that there was at least one other victim that I don't want to give too many details, right. but he had some very similar, if not identical experiences and was with him for a much longer period of time. Hmm. There was also the actual case that got him to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not privy to the political specifics of if he was actually fired or encouraged to leave. Right. As far as that, I think that was probably between Jack and Mike and maybe the Deacons, if it even went that far. But that victim was much more affected. And I don't want to make assumptions about what parts of his personality were affected by that. Right. But it was very clear that he had much more trauma from the interactions. And, and was this something that you, uh, were you friends with the person who was affected where you had conversations about it or what was the source for this info? He was a couple of years younger than me and I talked to him pretty often. I wouldn't say we were close friends, but we were very friendly and he was very guarded about talking about his lessons and those types of things. I wish I had something a little bit more specific other than my experience and overall perception of just years of being around this kid and yeah. seeing how he reacted to Doc Mike Zachary walking into a room or what was that reaction? Was it fear? Was it just like uncomfortable? Uncomfort like discomfort and usually averted eyes. Got it. And I didn't really notice this until much later. Right. But then having also looking back after having noticed it, I was like, there's been a lot of weird little things. And yeah, I'm not sure what parts of it to dig into because it's, Unfortunately, like you said, there was so much covered up and not shared that even from for people that were right there the whole time, outside of seeing the actual violation happen, we can't really know. Like when you say, because obviously this was the situation that Zachary was fired. That's not debatable. That was the situation that he yes. was fired over. What was the... like? As far as you knew at the time, or maybe even as far as you know now, depending on what information you've gotten, like what actually happened, it, it obviously it progressed further than 
what happened with you. Was there a specific like accusation made? Was it someone had caught? Like, how did this make it to the top where a decision was made to to let him go? Uh, and unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. The my perception of it was that the other victim had expressed something to someone, hmm. and then it. And maybe that was even his father, but I can't say with any certainty or evidence that is what happened. My perception is that he just at one point got enough courage to actually speak up. Do you remember the atmosphere at the church and college around that time? And like how, like how quickly from that point to Zachary being gone was there? My recollection is that it was pretty sudden that there was, I I believe it was just like an announcement on a Sunday that Mike was leaving. Okay. But no reason given really. No reason given. No. Did they say it was like over some kind of sin issue or did they literally just announce he was like retiring and leaving kind of thing? I wish I I should have looked up and actually (laughs) found the service or something. They probably turned off the recording, but I believe it was, the type of thing where they said he's been called to another ministry and he's going to go help out in West coast. Yeah. Um, they may not even have said where he was going to go, but I believe it was couched as a positive thing. That's so weird. Uh, what were your thoughts sitting there? Like when they're making this announcement, what, what was going through your mind when they're just playing it off as always going to go serve somewhere else? I was still largely, I was making my way out of the movement ideologically. Mm -hmm. But at the time I was still, I was still there and I was still there for my own choice at the time. So I was, I was like, this is definitely strange. Probably something's going on, but I tried to justify it. I I did justify it. Justify is the wrong word. I, I excused it as this is just what happens because I hadn't at the time identified the violations that had happened to me. The disconnect is so crazy when you're in these mental states that the the IFB and those rigid doctrinal mentalities put you in. You can see one problem happening to somebody else and you're so disassociated with yourself Mm-hmm. that you can't you can't look and see that the same thing's been happening to you to some degree or another everything is one isolated case of sin and it's it, there's no it's very difficult to look at your situation holistically right at yeah. any level really yeah it's interesting hearing obviously your perspective and i've talked to a couple people now who what was released in the statement wasn't accurate, which was that he or said in the statement from the pulpit was not accurate. Like he wasn't just leaving to go to another ministry. And from what it sounds like from the people I've talked to, it sounds like it was just a push off. So we don't have to deal with this situation. Yeah. I have golden States original, their original statement that they wrote. Let me screen share this so we can like look at it. That way people can. Here it is. On April 21st, 2014, Dr. Jack Cheber telephoned Dr. Paul Chapel to cancel breakfast appointment. The Dr. Chapel had requested with him. Dr. Cheber explained they did not think it, that it would be an appropriate time for them to meet because there was an ongoing criminal investigation in Santa Clara regarding Dr. Mike Zachary, oh, okay. the chairman of West Coast Baptist College's music department. And that's interesting by itself. I'm wondering who initiated that. But um, it says Dr. Chapel was told the investigation was ongoing and that it was criminal. And then they redacted. So this is an interesting part of the story too. The initial statement that Golden State put out, they ended up altering the statement to portray West Coast in a more positive light. And West Coast did the same with their statement. But what they pulled out was Dr. Treber suggested that Dr. Chapel not interfere with the police investigation. And Dr. Treber always viewed the allegations as both immoral and potentially criminal. That's why Dr. Treber immediately and personally reported within the hour the allegations to the authorities upon the advice of his legal counsel at the NCLL. 
Dr. Cheever never recommended that Dr. Chapel keep Dr. Zachary or any of his staff as that was Dr. Chapel's decision to make. Irrespective of potentially interfering with the police investigation, Dr. Chapel they threw him under the bus really hard in the first draft of this. Dr. Chapel proceeded to interview Dr. Zachary. During the course of these interviews, Dr. Chapel discovered a number of highly troubling facts and serious admissions from Dr. Zachary, Dr. Chapel's staff member, that led to Dr. Zachary's termination. It was later disclosed to Dr. Treber on May 1st, 2014, that one of his staff members may have known about some of these simple actions of Dr. Zachary. Once confirmed, this staff member was relieved of his responsibilities on May 2nd, 2014. The actions to which Dr. Chapel stated Dr. Zachary confessed were clearly acts of damaging sinful behavior. Dr. So, and it's so vague, and that's what I think is weird to do a statement and be so vague as to what it actually was. Dr. Zachary's dismissal from a high position of leadership within a Bible college was completely appropriate. We wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Chapel's decision to dismiss Dr. Zachary immediately. To be perfectly clear, when West Coast Baptist College hired Dr. and Mrs. Zachary, it was done without Dr. Treber's direction. Dr. Zachary, let me see. Oh. Dr. Zachary had resigned from Golden Yeah, this is where it's weird. Dr. Zachary had resigned from Golden State Baptist College and lined up his interviews at West Coast Baptist College before Dr. Treber was even aware of Dr. Zachary's future life plans. As a matter of policy, North Valley Baptist Church and Golden State Baptist College report all matters of potential child abuse to the authorities. We know that's not the case. Uh, we do not cover child abuse and we do not hire child abusers. We, do, we also do not tolerate immorality among our staff. Please pray for those who have been deeply hurt and affected by the actions of others to this sad situation. They're the ones that are truly injured. We took this opportunity with our staff and deacons to make sure that they understood that failure to immediately report allegations of child abuse is a crime in the state of California. It's grounds for immediate dismissal from our ministry. Transparency, child safety, and accountability are essential for successful ministry leadership. That's an interesting statement. West Coast was interesting as well, but they just pretty much said the same thing that they they amended their statement to basically correspond with what Golden State said. Just an odd situation. So yeah, so yeah, it, it, nothing. Here, here's the thing with the Zachary stories: nothing gels. Like the statements don't gel. Initially, West Coast said that they weren't informed of any wrongdoing uh, beforehand by Golden State. Then they edited their statement to say that them and Golden State had, you know, communicated. Then Golden State said that they had told Chapel. Then they redacted those states. So it's just a really weird situation. And then for the people who were there, I've been told by people that it was very clear what had happened. It was very clear and very clearly addressed to Treber. So it's just a very, it's one of those situations where like the most obvious answer is probably the right one as far as what happened. Yeah. And it seems, especially knowing the tense relationship between Treber and Chapel, I have to assume he just didn't even bother. Again, that's an assumption, but from what I've heard, it seems to back up the notion that Treber just passed off to chapel. And I know from people close to chapel, they said he was totally blindsided by it when it happened. But again, it's, you have to take both sides of that story with a grain of salt because West coast people and golden state people (laughs) don't tend to agree with each other. So you're getting a different version depending on who you're talking to. Yeah. They're they're enemies that play on the same team. (laughs) So yeah. What was your emotion when Zachary left were you relieved did you was it just kind of made you think in retrospect about everything for the first time and go oh that's super weird and did you bring that up to anyone at the time or kind of keep it to yourself i brought it up to i want a friend was the one that first brought it up to me because at the time i had the um sorry memory so weird you dig into it so the when the issue happened i talked to my parents about it and when, when he was removed or when he when left he was or whatever or resigned say happened whatever happened that was the one of the first times i remember really thinking that maybe there was like some real abuse that had happened there mm-hmm. other than just him being weird and Again, even at that time, I still hadn't sat and looked at the things that happened to me and seen anything. I I hadn't sat and looked at them at all. So the, it was just thinking about what had happened to that other victim and almost thinking that 
wow, that could have happened to me, but still not really legitimately in your mind, you're connecting the dots. You're so far removed. Oh, it could have been me. But now looking back, you're going like all the steps were there where it could have easily been me in addition to this situation. And based on all the different accusations, it, it doesn't seem like that was an isolated incident. It seems like regardless of what what has been reported or not, but the reality is like when you're removed from three different Bible colleges with the same accusations, it's pretty hard to say there's no reason to be suspicious. I, it is interesting, like the police investigation that he was under, I think it was from Florida. I think he was being investigated. I think it was actually four. I think, was he at Pensacola for a short time or no? I believe so. Yeah. So the one in Florida came out and the police said they couldn't find sufficient evidence of anything. But again, in cases like this, that's difficult. Unless you have immediate evidence, there's really, it's just your word against their word. But again, yeah. So you mean Pensacola, Hiles Anderson, Golden State, West Coast, he all, he leaves the same circumstances every time you can draw the dots. And again, without giving away anybody's private information, there's a pretty consistent narrative about what happened at Golden State. And it's not very gray about what happened. It's pretty black and white. Yeah. So was this the only, while you were at Golden State North High, was this the only time that you saw something like this happen? Or did you, because I'm looking at it as an outsider and going, pick and choose which of these stories do you want to talk about? There's a lot out of Golden State and North Valley. Did you know of any others while you were there or any other kind of cover-ups or really weird situations? I was aware of the Strofe case that had happened when okay. I was very little. Right. I remember being in a service where they talked about him leaving, or maybe I'm actually thinking of the service where he came back. I, that whole time frame is so weird for me because I was so young. With I, don't, your, I don't remember when he actually left. With your age, I would believe it would be him coming back because I believe yeah, he left at the sense. early, I believe he left the early 90s, which is like when you, yeah, you were born in 93. 93. So yeah, it, it was probably him coming back. But again, that's where, that's one of those things where it's the easy contradiction to spot is they said they, we do, do not cover child abuse. We don't hire child abusers. We don't tolerate immorality among our staff. Strofe is a shining example of the fact that they don't take that seriously because he's teaching yeah, Sunday school right now. <laughs> <laughs> like Sunday, he will be in a Sunday school classroom teaching. Yep. So yeah. So anyway, so the Strofe situation, you were aware of that. And at, at this time, how were you becoming aware of this stuff? Was it like an open secret at the church or was it because your family was close to some of the staff family, you heard things? My... Again, I want to be careful with what I say. There was many whispers, but I, open secret might be a good way to put it. Maybe not. Maybe it's not. My On the family side of things, my parents were never on staff, but my mom was friends with many women who were, their husbands were on staff, or my dad worked in the bus barn. So he did all the inspections for the buses for, their, for the bus ministry. So... You know, I spent a lot of time there as well. So mm-hmm. there'd be different things discussed in any of those you know, situations. But it was usually discussed as this is something that we just don't deal with. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll talk about it here and there to blow off some steam. Right. But it just is what it is. And whatever Treber says goes. Yeah. And there's a lot of smaller instances that I can think of in that I was personally involved with as a, as even in the school of them playing favorites and choosing how they were going to deal with one situation versus another based on how it would benefit either the appearance of the school, one of the bigger families, any of those things would come into play. And that's just not how justice and discipline should be dealt with. But for instance, There was, when I was in the high school, I had a girlfriend who I got caught doing sexual things with, and we were very lightly reprimanded. Maybe Mm -hmm. we got some demerits, didn't get kicked out, but I was already running sound at this time. She was in, she was doing the yearbook. There was a lot of reasons why they wanted us to stay around. 
there was another kid who basically accidentally dropped he, he dropped a, a condom on the ground in the school and somebody saw it so he immediately got kicked out huh. Im- immediately got totally kicked out of the school but he didn't actually do anything to anybody yeah right he didn't you know that was all that happened and um the main thing I'm trying to showcase there is the playing of favorites and, and how that can scale up or down right. the system. If it's happening in the small stuff, it's happening in the big stuff. Yeah. Right. There were tales of the pastor's kids being caught, you know, like making out in the bathroom and nobody really saying anything about it and the, any of those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. So I know too, uh, one of the stories that we had talked about was more of a church member, but a name that, that has come up a couple times with a couple people I've talked to from Golden State and North Valley. And I've been talking to so many people from there the last couple of weeks. I don't know why it, all of a sudden the flip switched, but or switch flipped. I don't know why the flip switched, why the switch flipped, but all of a sudden I'm getting all of these stories and it, it's pretty overwhelming. But uh, Norlin Macias is a name that's come up quite a bit. And when I first was told the name, I was like, okay, who's that? And it was a very vague, very vague, like to the point I was like, is there something actually wrong? And then I, they were like, is a member. I was like, well, that's not really North Valley's fault if he's a member. But uh, what's, who is Norland Macias and what was the big issue there or the problem that kind of came to the surface there? Yeah. So with Norlin, like you said, he wasn't a, on the church staff. Okay. So we can't really say that what he did was the fault of the church, but right. the church was his, where he found his, it was where he found his victims, usually. Hmm. Yeah, let me just start from the beginning of that story. So for me, I had a friend who I had recently become best friends with. He had recently moved next door. He was also going to the school. He was a couple of years older than me. And I don't know how he became involved with Norlin. I haven't talk to him about this. I don't know if I will. Our my relationship with that kid was not great last time we talked. Mm-hmm. But he told me that he knew this guy that had a boat and he wants to take us out on the lake and we mm-hmm. he's got inner tubes and we're just gonna have a good time and go boating on Anderson Lake. Right. So all right, cool. Mm-hmm. And so he introduces me to this guy, Norlin. We Basically, I, I don't know if I had to convince my parents, but there was, it was me, this other kid, his two brothers, younger, very much younger brothers. Okay. And I think one or two other kids, we all went out boating with just him. Mm-hmm. And on the boat, he, this was my initial experience. I'm telling that, but there was much more after this. Okay. So I'm just kind of like starting it this way. So the on the boat he or on the way he was making lots of let me back up a little bit when you're in the christian ethos especially a north valley type of place and if you're in the school anything that's remotely of the outside world can almost get a cool factor most of you don't even know what this is but they used to have something called a catalog and the catalog had things in there, and I, I'd see those, man, I'd like that. The catalog also, and I, God knows this is true, I, I know that there's a section in the women's that I should never look at. And I made a covenant with God, I would never use the catalog to ever go to a woman's section, because I don't want to see something I don't need in my mind. I need to protect my mind especially if you're starting to detach from some of the more hardcore ideas and doctrines and stuff, yeah. but you're still there because that's just what you do. That's where your family is, or this is just what you know, and you're finding your way. Things of the world can start seeming cool, whether it's sexual jokes, music, whatever that can, people that are into that can become like the cool people in a way. So for us young Christian boys, he was, cool in that sense. He was an older Christian man, but he would let us listen to other music in the truck. He yeah. would make sexual jokes. And yeah. usually they were just like dude, sexual dude jokes. They weren't like little boy jokes or anything like that. But yeah. 
he he knew how to be a bro kind of that kind of loosened us up to be like yeah he's just another another dude like us and we're just almost like a big brother kind of thing that shows you the cool music and the cool he's just cool yeah he's got a boat he takes us in his truck to the lake and we're listening to music on the way there talking about stuff that we thought we shouldn't probably be talking about but it's cool and get to the lake while we're on the boat that continues and it gets to a point where i'll just tell you what he did so he's you guys want to see something cool and at this point we're swimming outside the boat like we're not on the boat we're swimming around the boat and he's like you guys want to see a dolphin so (laughs) he pulls his penis out and he pees out of the water and then he like dives and that we were both, we were all like, what just happened? And I guess it, we were like, I guess it was funny. All right, whatever. So it just, it was what it was. And we just went on and yeah. I can't remember if there's anything exactly like that. Oh, I think panting happened a lot. Okay. How dudes in high school like to pant each other just to, like, right. to mess with each other. I, I think that was definitely a thing. He would get other people to do it too. So it wasn't like he was the only one doing it. Yeah. He'd be like, hey, you should go pants him while he's not looking. Like right. That type of thing. Yeah. You know, we did inner tubing. It was a fun time. I'm not going to lie. It was a bunch of dudes out on a lake seemingly having what seemed like innocent fun. Maybe not all the way innocent. <laughs> <laughs> but it's at that point, again, it's that normalizing thing where you're sitting there going, oh, he's just one of us. It's like how a bunch of teen guys do dumb stuff. But you're yeah. negating the fact he's how, how old? I... I don't know exactly, but he was probably in his forties already at this point. Okay. Okay. Definitely like middle age. Not one of the boys, (laughs) essentially. No. We get down on the lake, the boat back on the trailer, take it back to his house. And he treats it like you're his crew of sailors almost. So it's it was this whole thing where we went to his house early in the morning. We everybody was part of getting everybody was part of getting the boat ready and it was just like he had he was he had this thing where he would teach you to do things mm-hmm. and like this is how you hook a trailer up to a truck this right. is how you get a boat ready to go on the water and that it's like he's giving you value hmm. and anyway so every he, it's we're all this like crew helping him get his boat back to his house and we get back to his house everybody once the boat's parked and cleaned and covered and everything and it's almost like probably five or six at this point it's like all right everybody we're going to shower so everybody went in the house and we all it's quite a story man so we went in his house he's he's a two-story house so he had a few people hang out downstairs well and then uh, there was let me let me count says one two three four there's at least six six of us outside of him so maybe three of them go upstairs, three of us stay downstairs. So I don't know exactly what happened with the three, three-ish that went upstairs first, but while he helped them get started showering, me, my friend at the time, and I think maybe one of his brothers were downstairs like sitting on the couch, either watching TV or just talking or something. And he came downstairs and he's like, Hey, you guys should come in my office really quick. So we did. And he had porn open on the laptop and he was like, what do you guys want to watch? And this was not my initial exposure, but this was my first time not being on my own and Right. Just where it's acknowledged like as a thing. Right. Yeah. It was purely for me, it had been purely curiosity before that point in terms of searching for porn and looking at that. It wasn't something I was, I'll be fully honest, man. I hadn't masturbated before this. Okay. It was just the curiosity of seeing what's out there on the internet. I had done right. it like three or four times just, and I had already gotten caught too, actually by my parents at this time. Huh. So the three of us were looking at this and he's like, yeah, here you go. There's the lotion and uh, go to town. And I don't remember exactly what was said, but I made it clear that I hadn't done that before. 
And so he taught me how to do it. He didn't actually touch me at that time. He just showed me what to do basically. And then seventh or eighth grade. Wow. Okay. So this is prior to the Zachary stuff then towards the end. Okay. And then after. Okay. Got it. So remember I finished with my lessons around eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade is when I finished. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. After as terrible jokes are wanting to come out of me. It's not good. When I was done with that, apparently some of the other boys had finished showering. So he's like, all right, the rest of you go up and shower now. So the other three or four of them were still up there, you know, in towels, just chilling in his bedroom. And he had two showers. So there was like one that was in his bedroom And then there was a second shower that was just kind of like the upstairs bathroom. And so he had one of us each going in each of those. And basically he had us all line up, get naked, put towels on, and then go, he would say, all right, it's your turn. Go in the shower. So after you're in the shower, he would then walk in the bathroom and open the curtain and be like, all right, here's the soap. Here's the conditioner. Here's the lotion. As if you didn't know how to shower. And looking at you the whole time. And at that point I was like, Hey, this is getting weird. Right. But he was able to play it off as if it was normal. He's like, no, I'm just showing you where the lotion's at and everything. Don't worry, man. He just went back out. So I finished showering. I come out. I was the last one to finish with the showering. And then my friend, when I walk out is laying on the bed, getting a massage from this guy and like a, stomach massage like face up i was like okay this is a little interesting but they're like yeah it's just it feels good he's just gonna give you a massage it's gonna be fine and remember there's five other kids and was this all of your guys's first time going out with him or was this your first time this was my first time and i think at least two of the younger kids first time okay i don't know if it was my friend's first time or not i'm sure i knew at the time but i can't remember Okay. Well, I'm, um, I'm just, I was just, cause it obviously, and I know too, in a situation, what, like, what were you thinking at the time? Was there before that, were you thinking like, this is super weird or was it just at that point he'd made it like throughout the day had made it so normal to just be off color that it was like, it didn't it register. Like, it's like right in the middle of there, man. It was, it was definitely weird to me, but Something that somebody, I, I was the last podcast I was listening to, and I think it was your actual most recent one. I think she was saying something like when you're in that ethos and that, that mindset, it's so hard for you to have a different point of reference to say, oh, this is actually not okay. Mm-hmm. And, and this is actually somebody who's, taking advantage of me and not just trying to help or be cool or be open. And Mm. I think part of what helped me justify it at the time was a a lot of it was the idea that there's the fear of being gay, that a lot of us that grow up in that state of mind are are burdened with, and it's complete, you know, bullshit, but Ain't nothing normal about two men kissing one another in the mouth, ma'am. I've been all my life to the hospital. They got a blue crib for the boys. I said blue for the boys and pink for the, and blue for the, and it's still blue for the boys. And ma'am's got on a pink sweater. That's a lady right there. She's got on a pink sweater because she's a lady. Pink's not for boys. I don't look at me, you effeminate looking thing. Pink ain't for boys. Next thing you'll have on ear bobs and a dress. Somebody say amen. Blue is for and pink is for. Hey man, I'm checking those platform up here for. Blue is for and pink is for. It's supposed to be that way. I've never been to the hospital as a rainbow crib for the sodomite baby. 
Well, look at, look, look at Steve. He gonna be a sweet little thing. You see me and Steve, he use a sweet little something. It's, it's something sweetie, Sammy. They've stolen the sign of God's justice and the sign of God's promise. And, and, uh, and I'm talking about they've desecrated it. Or the sign of diversity. Hey, I ain't standing with that junk. Hey, man, I don't care if it's your granddaughter, who it is. It's not right and never will be right. I never want to marry a woman wearing steel-toed boots and a metal lunch box and a hard hat. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's not Adam and Steve. Amen. It frames the way you think about your social situations. Yeah. So in order in order to even think that maybe he's doing something other than just helping me out as a guy, I would have to think that he's a pedophile or gay. Right. And those and, things are just not on the table of consideration right. in your mind. And you're also saying there, like, if I, if you make a statement expressing that it is, it's going to get flipped on you and be like, why are you making yep. it weird? Yeah. And, and oh, I don't, you add, you're really gay. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't ask these to, to be like, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you say something was wrong? This is, I think for people listening who maybe don't, haven't listened to accounts or read, like this is one of the most common uh, grooming things like with men to boys is, Hey, let's watch porn or Hey, here's a magazine or Hey, I know you do this already. And the fact that he was audacious enough to do it at the scale he did is shocking to have six people there where any one of you could have easily started turning the tables on it. But yeah, it's bizarre. So back to, back to your story. I, I was just curious, did, was anyone there expressing any kind of like discomfort or was it just some people had already been there? So it was normal. And then you're too young. You're also in that age where you just don't say anything because you're the young one there. It was a mixture, right? Cause some of them were less comfortable than others, but the collective group was okay with it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to really like ruin what was going on. And it wasn't clear enough that he was a predator. Yeah. Have that flip right. flipping of the mind state. It was just, he's an older man with experience and he's showing us the ways of the world. Yeah. And he's awesome because he's exposing us to these things that we've been hidden from our whole life. And he had years of practice of doing this. And he, he would tell stories about people who, when I was young, were already middle-aged men yeah. that he had been around and, mm -hmm. and doing boating trips with. And big names in North Valley. Wow. Most like, of which had made their way out, by the way. <laughs> had made their way out of North Valley? Of North Valley, yeah. Wait, and when you say big names, you mean like, you don't have to give away names, but like big names like staff names or like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, staff names. Wow, okay. He finished the massaging my friend and that it didn't seem sexual. And I don't know if he even touched him in a, a private area outside of maybe his like legs or something. But when it was my turn, he had me lay on my stomach so he could massage my back. And I remember I, was, I had just showered. I was fully naked, just on his bed. And there's five other ki kids besides him watching this happen. I don't remember if he did much while I was on my stomach. He had me roll over on my back, like much sexually. He, oh yeah, he had me cover. That's right. He had, when I went on my stomach, he had me put the towel on my butt and then I flipped over. He's okay, cover yourself. I'll just do, I'll just massage your arms and your legs. And then he, when he was massaging my legs, he did not stop. And I, he started getting closer to my crotch and I was like, okay, that's enough. And he's trying to decide how much detail to give here because there's some very specific anatomy things. <laughs> yeah, and that's, again, like I said, it's totally up to you. And if you want to leave it that, that's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with. Due to 
lack of personal grooming knowledge and importance, mainly because guys in Christian world, they just, you don't talk about the right way to clean yourself and things like that. Like, those are off limits in terms of conversation. So if you aren't properly taught, there can be some issues, especially if you're younger. And I, it's valid, but I'm trying to figure out the right way to say it. Yeah. Basically, he determined while he was touching me there, he determined that I was not properly caring for myself. And I made it clear that, hey, you need to stop. I actually got myself up, got on the other side of the room. And I was like, that was not okay. And he's like, no, man, you got a problem. You're not, you got to take care of that, basically. And he was right. I did have a problem that he did help me identify. And I later, you know, learned how to take care of better. But he also did grab me and play with, yeah. That wasn't uh, a big enough red flag for him that I was probably not the right candidate. So I, that the rest of that evening, I don't want to say it went fine, but that was pretty much the end of that type of stuff. Okay. My friend, none of the other kids thought it was like a violation. They're just like, yeah, it was weird. Yeah. And I guess you have a, something you need to figure out, but it, I didn't internalize it as molestation. It was weird. But it was. He also coded it as I'm being helpful. Yes, thank you. Perfect. And that happened. That was a regular pattern. So, uh, in terms of him being helpful in exchange for your time, attention, and or favors, the actual physical stuff that was definitely the worst Mm -hmm. thing that happened. I I was around him off and on for about three years Mm. after that point, and it was much more me and him directly and that other friend, I stopped being friends with him. He ended up moving away and I had a much more direct relationship with Norlin at that time. And Mm. it was, there was some friendship. I got, I'm not going to lie. He did teach me some things, but it was always with, with an agenda. There was a time where he wanted to paint or he was painting a room in a neighbor's house and he was like, help me paint this room. You'll get experience painting. It would be great. And so I did that. And maybe like halfway through the day, we went back to his house and went back in his office and did the porn thing again. And that had bigger, a bigger effect in my life farther down the line, the the trend that he started there. But it was, uh, Yeah. It was a friendship from your side. It was very calculated from his side as far as what he was doing. Yeah. He would try to take us on trips and go do different things. But any time that my dad or any of my parents were going to be involved, then something would come up. It wouldn't work out. Whatever. There was one time he wanted to take us skiing or to the snow, like maybe me and two or three other kids and my dad was going to go. And he was like, oh, I got to work we can't go anymore or something. I don't remember what it was, but and my dad remembers that too. Yeah. Did did your parents ever think it was weird or or ever say anything about it? Or was it another one of those things you just didn't talk about in that kind of culture? It's sad because there were some signs and they did have some reservations about it. Yeah. But being in that culture, if other people are saying it's okay, or if it just seems like it's okay, it probably is. Yeah. If and other this, parents are sending their kids and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I was getting closer to being adult at this time. I was getting my driver's permit. So he would take me driving mm. and be like, Hey, I'll, I'll teach you how to drive. You can get some of your seat time with me. And he'd hold my hand on the shift knob and that type of stuff. And it was just like, now hold is the wrong word, but just extra yeah. touching similar to right. what I had said about Mike. There was lots of extra touching anytime anything was being shown, how to do something, how to whatever. 
So when did this kind of situation come to an end, at least for you? And when was the, was it just a conscious thing? Did it just naturally, you just parted ways? And then did anything ever happen? Did anybody ever say anything? Did, was anyone ever informed of what was actually happening on these trips? As far as legal action, I don't believe anything has been done. Hmm. When, what stopped, what got me to stop hanging out with him, (laughs) to be honest, I think he just stopped, stopped hitting me up. I can't really say that I consciously stopped hanging out with him. It may have been that he just lost interest. Yeah. But I was very busy. I still am. (laughs) I keep myself constantly doing things. So it's easy for me to lose track of people. And and I think that was probably what just happened. I was starting to work full time and you were less accessible and maybe less interesting too. If his type is the younger one, I was Mm -hmm. not that anymore. Right. I don't, Again, I don't know. So what was your, obviously those two situations are very formative, but what was your kind of final steps out of North Valley and then maybe the movement in general? Like what kind of led to that? There was a couple different factors. The girlfriend I had mentioned previously, we ended up, I was a little bit older than her, so I graduated first. And then she graduated afterwards. Once she graduated, we ended up getting married. Hmm. But before that, we had started going to the Spanish church that her family was a member of. So it's a a sister church of North Valley, but very loose in terms of how directly associated they were. They would send kids from their youth ministry to North Valley as the school. But I don't think Treber was really that on board with them. He didn't help them in any significant way. Yeah. It was a very small church. In Just Santa a Bay. kind of convenient relationship when it came to students and stuff like that. Pretty much. Yeah. So me separating from or going there instead of going to North Valley helped me see a lot of the pers- personal human issues with things that were going on in North Valley and right. the different standards and expectations and all the gossip and drama and all that stuff. Right. It, helped me see it from an outside point of view as, okay, this is largely negative and not what this Christian movement's supposed to be about. At least a lot of these things are negative, I should say. And from there, being in a Spanish ministry as an English speaker, it honestly gives, gave a bit of a disconnect to the actual teachings that combined with being full-time employed at effectively at Google mm-hmm. and in a, a corporate environments, working around lots of people, lots of different mindsets and talking to people that don't think the same way, being exposed to different types of media, different forms of thought. I eventually started forming some of my own ideas and found my way out of that church as well. Mm. My wife at the time was a little bit more hesitant to leave, and it wasn't, I don't want to speak for her. We have a good relationship at this point. We're um, soon to be divorced, but it's a positive situation. I want to make that clear. The church was holding very tightly to me and her. Okay. Because it was a very small church. And even though I barely spoke Spanish, I was, I don't want to say that I was looked up to, but they at least used me as an example often of different things. And most of the time they're pretty inaccurate, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. but it was just, I don't want to dig too far into that because it's not as relevant, but basically we collectively found that it was a toxic environment for us to to stay there. Mm. We stopped going at one point and there were some family issues that she went through. Overall, it was a, the right move. Right. And it's been, again, I don't want to speak for her, but she was very much a part of that time of my life. And so it was fitting her into my logical spiritual thoughts and decisions 
I don't want to say held me back, but it affected the ideas that I would entertain or the things that I would, you know, like it, I'm not sure what the point I'm trying to make there is other than when you're with somebody there, you have to consider their thoughts as part of yours. Yeah. And sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be very limiting, especially if you're trying to find a new way of thinking. Right. And they're still holding very tightly to the old way of thinking. Well, and when your entire life is built around a, especially a religious concept that guides everything that you do to make a, the baseline thing. Like if every Sunday you go to church as a family and you don't want to go to church anymore, that's a rift. If you have a kid and are we going to teach them about God or not? That's a rift. You know what I mean? Like that, that's a substantial, especially within the IFB where it's not even just theological, like just practice, like day to day life. What movie do we watch? What shows do we watch? What can I drink a beer at the end of the night? All of those things are going to create these rifts. And you're right. Some couples do just grow and they go the same direction, whether regardless of whether they stay religious or not, like their move out of the IFB is a traumatic thing enough. But especially when you've got someone who's completely going in a way where it is polar opposites, there's a lot to reconcile there. And yeah, it's, it's like becoming a totally different person because it is like your whole personhood is the IFB when you're in it. Yeah. Absolutely. So just to finish that thought out, I went on what I'll call a journey over a number of years searching for knowledge, truth, whatever you want to call it. I watched a bunch of podcasts about people talking about different spiritual, physical, scientific, all types of ideas that were not mainstream and comparing to things that I already knew and different religions, different spiritual concepts, eventually found my way to reading and mostly listening to many books. Audible has been the best tool for me to get and to gather knowledge and information and just understand other people's perspectives and ways of thinking. There's nothing like, look, yeah, like, sorry. But a book is no, the, I agree. the best way to really understand and internalize somebody else's idea in a five minute YouTube video or a one hour YouTube video. It's not, not going to be the same as a 20 hour book. There's just whole different orders of magnitude of understanding. So I at one point considered myself atheist. I then considered myself agnostic and then i found a mesh of the two i was calling myself an agnostic atheist which is i'm taking the logical root of each of those words atheist is theist with an a prefix right so it's lack of god or lack of belief a theist believes in god and a gnostic knows god so if you have if you're atheist you lack belief And if you're agnostic, you lack knowledge. So basically I was saying, I don't know and I don't believe. That was what that meant. So that was at this point, probably a year and a half, two years ago, maybe three. Mm -hmm. And I then became much more interested in some of the more Eastern traditions and ideas about spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I I hesitate to use the word Eastern because for a Christian audience, that's often a very taboo way of thinking. It's it's mysticism. And I've gotten to the perspective myself that any religion that we have in the present was the spiritual concepts and understandings of some person in the past and maybe multiple people, maybe a group of people or a kingdom, but it was their understanding of our reality to the most relevant, most relevant information available to them. And then has been interpreted by generation and generation largely 
not largely, often with some manipulation to either control a population or affect a certain way of living in a population. At least the, that's what a lot of the, the mainstream religions have played that role, whether or not that's what they mean to a person in it. That's the role they have played and how they were used by the people in power that were touting it at the time often. To boil down to where I'm at now, I'm a huge fan of comparative religion, which is the study of any spiritual concept as it relates to other spiritual concepts. Hmm. And, and you can scale that up and down however you're interested in it. And for me, that has practically meant listening to books or lectures or podcasts with people of different religious faiths, backgrounds, understandings, and drawing the overarching comparisons between them all, finding the deeper truths that are buried behind a lot of the doctrines and the, the weird things that are often like a psychosis almost yeah. that overshadow the, the unity and the duality that they're all have at their core. Hmm. Something else that I've learned after having gone down this path is it's amazingly difficult to articulate these ideas because it's, it, that's why these are books. That's why the Bible is a book. It's huge because it's got so much information it needs to convey. Right. And I just went on a rant and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. No, no, I was just curious where you're at and, and what your kind of thought process was. And it, do, it doesn't sound like it's new. It seems like this is where you were at, but you weren't able to articulate it or didn't have the access to other information to even identify. That's what you described feeling like early on was like you, you under, you understood it, but you didn't understand it. There was this kind of, I guess, again, like a rift between what you were doing and actually believed. And yeah, it's definitely harder to articulate because when you start thinking in these terms, like you're dealing more subjective than objective. So there's a lot of, you can have a conversation about different religions without there being this anchor. When you identify with a religious concept, you're, you do compare every religion to it to disclaim it instantly. There's no nothing to be cleaned from this because I believe this. So I can only imagine like someone who's coming at it from all of this is rooted in one concept that we've all pushed our own different way. Yeah, it's going to be more difficult. And, and I pick that up like when I read Hitchens or Dawkins or when I read, I see that wrestling to grapple with what is the thing the, that's the fueling all of this <laughs> right yeah and, th and that's where and that's where i'm personally like i struggle when i read hitchens or dawkins is like, i still struggle with it and and i know it's like an old apologetics thing but like i always struggle with i'm like what's the objective reality because there has to be like a baseline objective truth and yeah. so that's where i struggle because i uh, like when i read uh, hitchens god is not great and that was one thing that, and I love, I, I like Hitchens a lot more than Dawkins. I think Hitchens is more reasoned. I think sometimes Dawkins can get into the same thing fundamentalist Christians can get into, where mm -hmm. he gets so aggressive, he loses his point. An uncritical, kind of too open-minded, so open-minded your brains fall out attitude is a great pity because it means you miss such a lot. And merely to say that religion is harmless isn't good enough. Hitchens is very well thought out and articulate. What about this idea of Jesus, uh, Christopher? You don't buy it at all, I take it. Well, I don't think he was the son of God. You don't? No, I don't think his mother, was, think a, I don't think his mother was a virgin. And I don't think he died and was resurrected or revived uh, or resuscitated. None of that? None of that. And even if he was, by the way, any of those things, he would only have that in common virgin, virginal birth, miraculous circumstances, mysterious death, with many, many other mythological figures. It wouldn't prove, even if it could be proved, mm -hmm. wouldn't prove his doctrines were true or moral or ethical, which I don't think they Does are. Does it surprise you to know that Einstein probably believed in God? That's pretty surprising. No, I, I absolutely know that the contrary is true. Well, if, Einstein uh, wrote right. very, very clearly he was a pantheist or possibly a deist, he did not believe in a personal God, a God of religion. He didn't believe in a God who could intervene in human affairs, would answer prayers, 
would take side you know, yeah, in a war, would point. care what you ate there's or a, who you had sex with. There's a certain um, self-absorption in the idea that the sky god is watching me particularly do my show right now. Right. There's something strange about that. Do you, do you believe that? Do you think he's watching you specifically right now? Yeah, Jesus said he, uh, God numbers the hairs on, on our head. He does, it's not just... So it's Google. <laughs> yes, and, and is there self-absorption in that? <laughs> yeah. So here's, here's, the, here's the fundamental issue. Of course you can believe in an omniscient God and believe in it in a way that flatters yourself. There have yeah. been all kinds of believers who, who take the doctrine that God knows all things and has, has the hairs of your head numbered, and they do it in a self-flattering way, self-absorbed way. Yes, that does happen. But it's also something that can humble you if you think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Correctly, it it makes you it helps put everything in perspective. Okay, it makes you too humble. Okay, it makes, you into, it makes you into a servant. I think one thing though that I always uh, one thing I always wrestled with Hitchens was that I felt like he he used a lot of concepts I felt were baseline theological concepts without recognizing them as such. And so, like yeah. uh, for me, again, as someone who still considers themselves an Orthodox Christian, like. I always wrestled with like when I'd read Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, I'm like, you just seem like there's still so much you're borrowing from a Christian worldview, but they would also say Christian Faith. worldviews borrowing it from A, B or C. But uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I can talk on that a little bit. If you like Hitchens and Dawkins and the staunch atheist crowd, largely they still have a religion and their right. religion is evolution. Yeah. And they often have, not taking any time and effort to have any real s experience with any type of spirituality. Yeah. And, and that can, I, I'm not really saying anything specific when I say a spiritual experience. It, it, they've had zero or they mm -hmm. won't acknowledge if they have one. Or some like Dawkins and, would say we're purely just results of this. We're machinery. You know what I mean? Like, He's very open about that. Hitchens gives a lot more room for more of the arts and like, why do we appreciate things and things like that? Yeah. There's the, it's, I'll use a spectrum to do this, right? So the rigid Christians would be on this end of the spiritual spectrum. If this is spirituality and this is reality on this side, right? Religious ideals will be over here and atheists will be over here. But what you want is balance, right? And mm -hmm. so to reach that middle point, you have to have a healthy perspective for both the spirituality and the science. Right. And the problem is that science as it stands can't explain satisfactorily enough spiritual experience. Yeah. And so we have this crowd of people who claim science is opposed to revolution uh, to religion right and that and, and spirituality i should say science is opposed to spirituality but those people largely haven't done any real spiritual investigation for themselves and if they mm. i i can't say if they haven't my perspective on that is that they weren't doing it sincerely enough or they just turned themselves off to it at some point. Mm -hmm. I have gotten to the point where I've deeply analyzed many different aspects of science and been able to draw conclusions with spiritual realities mm -hmm. and to meld some of the two. Uh, and this gets back to where it's really hard to articulate these things because it's all a brain concept and my perspective is is what shapes that and the words that come out of my mouth can only do so much to give you that perspective yeah because it's my experience that got me here yeah but if you boil reality which is matter all of this down to the most basic that we're able to as humans it seems to be energy and you have varying scales of complexity and chaos as you go up and down the reality scale. Mm -hmm. So things seem pretty rigid 
solid and like stuff we feel solid but if you break down the molecules that are in our hands they're moving faster than we can practically fathom mm. and then if you go down a, a, a scale smaller than that you then again have solid particles that are moving really fast and you go down a scale smaller you again have chaotic energy moving really fast and then you can get another particle below that and if you scale up from us you have planets and stars which are hugely breaking our understandings of physics and yeah. every time we find something new we're like what now we have to figure out how this works yeah. or it just totally breaks how we thought things worked so the point i'm making with the scales of complexity is you can boil material down to energy and if the energy that is in a molecule if that's positive energy the space around that molecule or that particle is going to have to be negative energy and man i'm getting so deep into this <laughs> <laughs> the point to take away from that is there is no real separation between anything. Mm. It looks like there is space in the air between me and you, but there's actually air molecules that are filling mm. it. It's completely full of stuff. And if it's not the molecules, it's the energy around it. And lack of real separation between any real material means we are all really one and the same. We're just different concentrations, fluctuations, and vibrations of the same stuff. I can take that and look at the Bible, and when the Bible says God is everywhere all the time and knows everything, maybe God just is everything. Maybe we are God. Not in a direct sense, but in a overarching sense. And this is extremely difficult to internalize in a meaningful way because mm -hmm. it just sounds like a Jesus complex. And it's really not that. Yeah. It's not because that focuses on one man. This is about everything. And the material in this drape is just as divine as the spiritual consciousness that flows through humans. And it's really, for me, it's really that simple. But it took years to get to a point where I could reconcile yeah. the extreme science with the extreme spirituality. And, and I took the Bible example because this is largely a Christian audience, but I in no way am, am in no way Christian anymore. I, I don't have anything that I claim. I have my own ideas. I'm Bruce <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure things out. Right. Yeah, that's intense. That's probably Sorry. the most intense <laughs> answer to that question <laughs> for sure. I feel like we're in like hour three of a Rogan podcast. That felt like the conversation that we just had, but uh, yeah, no, yeah. it's, I watched all 700 at least of the first of those. <laughs> no, that's something where, but again, I like talking about that stuff and I could spend hours doing that conversation but there's again i think that's so important to at the end of the day where i always come to is i'm just like you have to look into it for yourself you have to Absolutely. say yourself and again i think people get frustrated with me because i'm not i'm not pushy as far as christians go and i think for me i guess i get get to the situation where i'm just like if i'm forcing someone to see it my way what's the point if what i share is compelling enough for them to agree that's great. But yeah. at the point that I'm saying, I know you don't see any of this. I know that you don't understand any of this or whatever word you want to say. If I force you to say you see it, it yeah, doesn't benefit insecurity. anybody. It's that's insecurity your in insecurity. your own worldview. The fact I've told people like, you know, what I just said, yeah, when I was reading Hitchens book, why are you reading Hitchens book? It's like, is it going to damage what I believe? Is my belief that fragile that I can't right. open up a Hitchens book? So anyway, but yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. And honestly, man, like I said, I could talk about this all day, but I really appreciate you sharing. And I didn't know, 
I, I really didn't know anything past the Zachary stuff from our conversation, but it takes, I had Kelly Palfion who wrote Men Too and talks through the difficulty of, especially growing up in the male culture we did, uh, it's so hard to talk about that. So I just want to say like a huge thank you to you for being so open. And I want to give you props. It takes a lot of courage and it, it does. I think it speaks to you being outside of that world that you've got the, that you found the freedom to share your voice and, and to be able to talk about that. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, man, I just thank you for sharing and thank sure. you for just being so open. It, it, that really means a lot to me. And I, I don't just say that, that really that's really huge. And I, and I think that's commendable on your part to be so willing to talk about this. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to talk, postulate. <laughs> I know. We're, I'll Wonderful. get stuck in those loops forever. But yeah, man, I really appreciate it. And uh, definitely want to stay in touch. And I, I know for sure there's going to be a lot of people who are helped by everything that was said. And uh, it's definitely plain to think about, I think, after this one. But yeah, once again, just thanks so much for for coming on and being able to be willing to talk. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.